Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this talk, How to Teach History to Different Ages and Levels at the Same Time. I'm John Degree, and I'm the founder of The Classical Historian with my family. Before I get started, I'd like to just know how many of you have children under the age of 12? If you could raise your hand. How about uh, over 12? Okay, wonderful. So this talk is for both ages, and it's also for those who have children under 12, but you're thinking about, what am I going to do when they get to the stage where they want to start analyzing and discussing things? And I have little children at home as well. Before I get um, into the talk and demonstration about how to teach younger kids and older kids in very practical ways, I'd like to introduce you to myself and my family. This is a picture we took last year in Corona del Mar. I've been married with my wife, Zdenka, for 24 years, and we have seven beautiful children. Our oldest is turning 22 very soon. He just graduated from UC Santa Barbara, and he's going to be getting married and living in Prague, the Czech Republic, for a couple of years. And he is taking over our online teaching classes. For the last four years, he's been supporting himself as a freelance writer um, through the internet, through various ways that he somehow figured it out. And I attributed that to my fantastic wife, who homeschooled him, and he learned how to be an independent thinker and a good writer. And uh, from a big family, he knew he wanted to help us out. So he really is a hard worker. My second uh, oldest daughter, Jessica, she's going to be 20 years old. She's currently an au pair, or a nanny, in Spain. And she's visiting the Czech Republic for about eight days right now. And she's a student at Hillsdale College in Michigan, a school that I strongly recommend. I love Hillsdale College. My, my, my daughter really likes it too. And then we have Aneshka, she's under Adam. She's 17. Teresa is 15. Philip is 13. Monica is 10. And Christina is 7. And we live in San Clemente, California. We've been living there for about 12 years. Before that, we lived in Tustin. And before that, we lived in Humboldt County for one year, and then for four and a half years in the Czech Republic. When we moved there, it was actually Czechoslovakia, and then in 1994, it split into two, peacefully, with no fighting. Czech Republic, Slovak Republic. And before that, my wife and I lived in Turkey, where we taught windsurfing to Germans for about seven to eight months, and that was our extended honeymoon. My wife is from Prague, Czechoslovakia, and so that's why my older kids are going towards that country to get to know their, their mom's home. And the older kids can speak Czech pretty well, but the younger ones can't because we've gotten so busy here in our great country of America. I'm from Santa Ana, Orange County, and but born and raised there. And I went to the University of Redlands, which is in Redlands in San Bernardino County. One semester I studied in Washington, D.C. Another semester I studied in Austria and, and Germany. And then after graduating, I studied in Czechoslovakia and in Germany, language, German and Czech. For about four years, I was teaching history and English in a variety of places in Prague. That's where my wife and I married. And uh, through these experiences, I learned excellent ways how to teach with games and also with the Socratic discussion. Uh, through games, I believe, I learned mainly through my wife. And through the Socratic discussion, I learned by learning Czech and meeting with people and discussing all sorts of things. We moved back to the United States of America in 1996, where I completed my teaching credential, and I have been a 
public school teacher for the last 19 years in Santa Ana, California at a middle school where I teach grades 6, 7, and 8. About 12 years ago, when my wife and I moved our family to San Clemente, that's when we began homeschooling for many of the reasons that you are homeschooling. We wanted them to know and love God. We wanted them to know and love Jesus. We wanted them to be reading the Bible every day, praying every day, learning morality. And also, we wanted them to be on fire for learning academics and uh, to be excited about it. And we wanted uh, a calmer home life. Um, and I don't know if we have a calm home life today. I think if you were to ask my wife, who's at our booth downstairs, she would probably say no, because we're so busy r running around with our children. But our relationships are calm and beautiful and content. And so I think the homeschooling really helps in bringing the family closer together. And also, when the children get older, they will come back to you more than in families where I think they're not homeschooling because they're so used to talking and getting to know their moms and dads. And they get to understand what their moms and dads are about. So we've experienced that with our older, oldest two. They've, they've been coming back more and more and asking for advice and, and help in, uh, in relationship type things, right? Very important things. OK, how to teach history all at once. So um, many classical educators speak of these three different areas where we can see children and think about them in terms of how they learn and what is the most appropriate method or way to teach them. And this comes from an essay written by Dorothy Sayers called The Lost Tools of Learning. Is anybody familiar with this? So I would strongly recommend, re recommend that you read this. So in the, in the grammar stage, it can be explained in many ways. Um, I used to just describe it as a memorization stage where kids like to memorize things and show what they learn. But recently, my wife and I have been rethinking this. Also, it's a discovery age. Everything is a, a wonderful and exciting discovery for children. So to give an example of the memorization stage, under the age of 13, kids love to go to the zoo. And it's very exciting to take them to zoos. They want to see the animals, see how they move, see what types of things they eat. Um, I'm reminded that now my 10 and 7-year-old have a bunny rabbit. And they love the bunny. And they take such great care of this animal. Children under 13 are very happy and content to learn the basics about animals. Over 13, when the kids are still at home, they really don't want to go to the zoo. There's nothing there for them. They're not interested anymore to see how they eat, what they look like usually. Kids 13 and over hate to go to zoos, um, typically. Now, it's not because they're bad kids. It's because they're ready to analyze and to think. And they have opinions. And there's nothing for them at the moment at the zoo for them to analyze and to think and to discuss. So they're kind of lost. So I like to kind of think of that as an example thing for moving from the grammar to the logic stage. Now, to the discovery in the grammar stage, taking your children to museums at this age, talking to them about everything, even taking them to this convention. My 10 and 7-year-old are here, and they're having a wonderful time. They helped set up the stand. They took things out of boxes. They arranged them beautifully. They loved doing this. It was such a discovery for them. And it's going to be so exciting. And they asked about the hotel room. Is it nice? Does the air conditioning work? Is there a pool? All of these things, discovery. So in history, also, everything for them will be new and exciting. And it's a discovery for them. In the logic stage, this is when kids are starting to think or come to realize that they think that they know everything and that you don't. And they start to challenge you. Why do you do this? At this age, for history, it's appropriate to not just show them what history is about, the who, what, when, and where, 
but they are ready to learn how a historian analyzes things. How does the person who wrote the history book decide what to put in the history book? How does he come to the conclusion that the New Deal was good for America or the New Deal was bad for America? Kids aged 12 to 15 are ready to learn what a historian does. And so in our curriculum, Classical Historian, we created a method where it has all of the tools of the historian and the kids learn these tools. And I'm going to go over those briefly today. Then, once they learn the tools, they are given open-ended questions. And we'll, we'll show, I'll show you a few of these today as well. And I have a, a little sample Socratic discussion at about minute 45 that, that we'll play of uh, my, my, my children from college down to middle school. We'll be discussing about why the Roman Empire fell. In the rhetoric stage, age 15 and on, their ability to analyze increases and they should be made to present and get much practice in rhetoric and presenting in as many possible areas as they can. Something that we have that ties all of these things together in a simple way are these, are these books. And these books are titled uh, Teaching Ancient History with Games, Teaching Medieval History with Games, American History with Games, and the Constitution with Games. And the way that uh, we use these is we pick a day of the week that's going to be the history lesson with all of the kids. And the older kids receive this uh, one of the books, let's say for example your family decides next year, I guess this is kind of a big decision anyways, what history content will your family be focusing on next year? I think that's, that's something that many homeschool families discuss. And if you have one child, maybe it's a simple, simple answer, but if you have many different children of different ages, should one learn a different history, should another learn a different history? Uh, there's not a quick fix answer. Uh, it depends on each family. Maybe for your family it's best there, that you choose American history for the older ones and ancient for the younger ones. But if possible, try to have the same history content for all of the ages. So next year, for example, uh, we can say let's focus on American history. And then you choose your different items that you'll have for the different age groups. Our books are written so that they're tied along with our games. Everybody likes to play games, especially kids, and the books teach the history behind the games. So in our card game that has 48 different history images and hints or clues. The book teaches each of the card games, or I'm sorry, each of the individual cards. So if one of the cards is the Constitution, there will be one paragraph about the Constitution in the book. One of the cards is the bald eagle, and here there's one paragraph about the bald eagle. So in that hour where you have your history hour for the family, the older children can read out loud four cards, for example. And then the whole family can play the card game. So it's something, something light and easy, but they are learning some content on the way. And then the following week, the older kid will read the next four cards, and you'll play the game again. After 10 to 12 weeks, all the cards will be read out loud. And so at the beginning of the, of the lesson, you'll have the four cards on the table that were read first and ask the children, what do you know about this image? And have, start with the youngest one. What, what do you know about the image? And then go up to the oldest and see what they know. And then at the very end, have the oldest child read out loud that paragraph again. So I'm going to go deeper into the games now 
to, um, and we're going to play them here as well, so you get a, get a feel for what I'm talking about, the, the card games. But <coughs> the, the easiest game we have are these memory games. Little children love to play memory. They're very good at it. How many of you have kids that like, like to play memory games? So they, they usually win also, because uh, kids' focus is laser beam on that one, I, one thing they're doing, and our, our focus is, is everywhere else. What's interesting with this game is that the kids learn at a very young age what things look like that later they're going to study. And they learn what those things are named as well. So right at the age of five, five is a good age to start the memory. Th they're learning the most important buildings in ancient civilizations, right? The Colosseum, Zeus, the Ten Commandments, uh, Christ on the cross, Julius Caesar, or from, or from the medieval times, the Pieta, the Mona Lisa, castles, or of course, American history, the White House, the Constitution, the telephone. They're, they're learning what these things look like at a very young age. And when they play this game, when they turn the tile over, have them read it out loud. If they can't yet read, then you read it out loud. And very soon, they'll have 48 or 32 images memorized, what, what the name of the, each 32 of the images are. This is, this is so easy to do. Um, I think it's very simple for people to kind of overlook it and not consider it important. But uh, if you were to visit a public school and ask 13-year-olds, to tell you a little bit about the Model T Ford, most of them wouldn't be able to. Or Mount Rushmore. Or what is George Washington doing on that stamp? Or the Pilgrims. Uh, most Americans wouldn't be able to tell you a little bit about those. But when you play this game, and before you play it, you read out loud the paragraph about these images before, then the kids begin to learn these naturally. So, for example, here's a paragraph on pilgrims. The pilgrims were separatists, Christians who wanted to separate from the Church of England. In Europe, each person had to follow the religion of the leader. In 1620, the pilgrims left England for North America on the ship Mayflower. They founded Plymouth Colony in present-day Massachusetts and wrote the Mayflower Compact the first self-written governing document in America. So history is something that can be learned by overlearning it. Um, I think it's fun to learn a little bit of history and then to play a game. So they're engaging with it and they get to, they get to touch it and feel it and then they're excited to play that game. I've had many moms come to me and say, we love your card game. We play this every day at lunch, and we've learned so much history from it as I go to the different conventions. And so that's, that's really exciting to hear, um, not to discount a game and how much a child can learn. So if our children knew 48 paragraphs from ancient, medieval, American, we have the Go Fish Bible game and the Constitution game, they would have a foundation in history, a very solid foundation in history. The next game that I'm going to describe to you, and we're going to go ahead and play it here in a few minutes, is the Go Fish game. And these are the card games. They teach facts, chronology, logical thinking, and geography. This is a picture of one of the cards from our ancient game. It has a title. It's the Spartan Soldier. He left home at age seven. He stopped living with his mom and his, with his mom. He was a soldier until age 60, and he was the best Greek warrior. The Spartan Soldier is part of ancient Greece, and so are 
Parthenon, Socrates, and Zeus. So the easiest way to play this game is go fish. So you hand out four kids to or four cards to each of the kids, and you place the deck of cards in the middle, and you've got the cards there, and you ask one of your children, do you have any ancient Greece cards? If she does, she has to give you all of them. If no, you say go fish, and you have to choose a card. And in playing this game, the kids get used to saying the words of history, and they get comfortable with, okay, ancient Greece has these four cards on them. And you know kids, they'll choose a favorite category that they'll really want to have those four cards. And so they'll have these things memorized. Um, also, all of these cards have the paragraph in our books. So it, it goes together. So you can read, read four cards from the book, and then you play the card game. Now the second game, which we're going to go ahead and play here as a group, this is a card from our, our medieval times, because it was painted in the medieval times. Of course, it happened in the ancient civilizations. But after playing this, they'll have, you know, they'll know the Last Supper is from Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, so the next game is called Collect the Cards. And Collect the Cards uh, is a favorite among, I would say, 10 to 15 year olds. The way that's played is you take one of the cards and you read out loud the hints and everybody gets one guess what, the, what it is. For example, let's say I'm playing with four people, and the first hint of this American history is second. And so Jack gets to guess, gets it wrong, Mary, Sue, they all get it wrong. Second hint is Abigail, and then uh, they all get another guess. Third hint is Alien and Sedition Act. Now, if somebody guesses correctly, does anyone know? John Adams then that person wins the card. If no one guesses correctly, then the reader wins it, and then the next person is the reader. So the first few times that they'll play this game, whoever is reading at that moment will win the card, but you'll have all the three hints read out loud, and um, they'll be learning because kids want to win. Uh, not because they love history yet, but because they want to beat their sister or they just want to win a game because it's exciting. And so um, this is an excellent game. It's also an exciting game. And the way that we're going to just demonstrate it here is um, I'm going to walk around the room and pass each group of people a few of the cards from our five games. And I would like it if you played collect the cards with each other to experience it. Because it's something fun. It's exciting. But a lot of times when you're, when you're told about something, it's, it, you kind of don't, re don't really see it. And so, um, are there any questions about how to play this game? No? So, quick review. One person is going to read out loud the first hint. Everybody gets one guess, or five seconds. So if you don't have a guess, you have to say, I don't know, within five seconds, so it doesn't take forever. And then, after three hints, if nobody knows, then the reader wins the card. Okay, I'll go ahead and pass these out. What's fun being a history teacher for the whole year is I start playing this game day one when the kids know absolutely nothing because uh, a couple reasons. It's a great icebreaker. It's the beginning of the school year. You play, you play a game and they're very happy and uh, there isn't any pressure on the teacher to really deliver just a powerful lesson that's going to shape their world for that year. Um, but they get to play a game and also as the teacher you get to view how they think and how they interact with each other. If you, if you can, when you're, when you're teaching your children at home, have them play with each other and you, you, you learn a lot. You probably know everything about your child already. But uh, I guess from a dad's point of view, uh, because I'm not always my, my wife's with my children all the time. I'm with them some of the time. And so this is really a beautiful gift for me to see how they think. So we had a great question. Do the Go Fish cards 
the images match the images on the memory games. And yes, they do. They're the same images. There are just more cards. So the, there'll be some, some images on the cards that won't be on the memory game. And um, I think since I had the blessing of living in Central Europe for, for many years, and I taught there, and I also met history professors and teachers, and we discussed all the time. Um, I made sure that in our, all of our games, uh, our, sorry, our ancient and medieval game, and in our histories for the curriculum, it's not just about the United States or Great Britain, but you also learn about the Slavic world and Asia and, Asia and, and Africa. So uh, kids are really open to learning anything, so they'll, they'll appreciate that too. Uh, one of the cards here about Saint Vladimir. He is, he is the one who brought Christianity to the Russians. Now, it was the apostles, Method and Cyril, who brought Christianity to the Russians, but it was up to Prince Vladimir to convert and give up all of his wives and concubines and completely change his life. And uh, Saint Vladimir the Great. Okay, wonderful. So before we move on to the part where I'm going to teach you about how to teach older kids, I'd like for us to play a game here. And uh, the winner will earn any one of these games that are up here. So the way that we'll play is I'm going to read out loud the hints from our American history game. And if you know the answer, raise your hand. Whoever raises their hand first, I'm going to call on. If you get it right, then you win the card. And we'll just remember that you won it, and I'll put it right here. If you shout out the name, uh, I'm not going to recognize that as a <laughs> correct <laughs> answer. And anybody else can raise their hand and say the same thing and win it. So then they're, they're learning some, kids learn structure in that way also. Um, so the first one to win three cards wins any one of the games. And we'll also throw in one of the, one of the books, so a game and a book. Okay, from American history. Hint number one, Declaration of Independence. Hint number two, Library of Congress. Hint number three, Monticello. Jefferson. Yes, Thomas Jefferson. Very good. So then our, our paragraph would be how he is the author of the Declaration of Independence and something about that. And then he donated the first 10,000 books that became the Library of Congress and he built Monticello. Okay, second card. Francis Scott Key. Yes, you got one. Some of them are very challenging and vague because we wanted to be humorous, so um, there's no way you would ever get this one. I'll go ahead and read out loud the hints. So this one usually aggravates the children when they're playing the first couple times, but then they kind of like these. Um, the West, Hunters and Traders, and the answer is Frontiersmen. Okay, Louisiana Purchase, President Jefferson, Sacagawea. Lewis and Clark. Yes, Lewis and Clark Expedition, all right. Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Wright Brothers. No. Hint number two, the Wright Brothers. First flight. I'll accept that, first airplane. First Good. 1861 to 1865. Civil War. Yes. This is a challenging one, um, but it's not as bad as the Frontiersman. Rocky Mountains Trail. Independence, Missouri. Pacific Ocean. The Railroad? No. Oregon Trail? Yes, Oregon Trail. That one's impossible to guess. Sorry. Daniel Boone into Kentucky, great hunting. Aldo? No. No. Um, hint number four is a path through the forest. Um, and it's, it's the name of the path. 
the Wilderness Road. Okay, so this is very vague, but we'll just giddy up, wagons ho, chuck wagon. So what was it called when there was a line of? Wagon train. Yes, wagon train. Second, uh, nicknamed the Second American Revolution. War of 1812. Right, is that three? Okay, all right, so, so you won. Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, so that, um, those games work for, for all ages, um, geared towards the younger ones. And now I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about our curriculum that we have for older kids when they're ready to debate and argue. And they don't want to just memorize history, which is the focus of all of the other programs, to memorize history from a particular author or a particular publisher, which is not bad, it's good. But what people usually do when they're forced to memorize things is they will forget them and they won't learn the uh, essentials of history. They won't, they won't learn how things are related to each other. They also won't, won't learn all the analytical skills that go together in learning history. Um, it was exciting for me the other day in my class, I asked the students, uh, how were the Spanish able to defeat the Aztecs with only 600 men? And uh, one of the students knew the answer because he had done his own research earlier in the year. And I had taught him how to do research and I challenged him to come up with opposing viewpoints to this because the standard textbook um, would talk about only the technology of the Spanish and how superior strong they were. Uh, but, uh, but he f knew the real answer was that the Aztecs were so brutal to all of their uh, neighboring tribes that the Spaniards were able to make alliances. But he knew this because he learned the tools of history and how to do research. And so this is very helpful when we're confronted with learning about current events as well. And we're being bombarded in social media with only a certain viewpoint of current events. Something uh, shocking happens around the world or in the United States and the media wants us to believe one, one side of it. If we are people who are trained in history, we know we need to research and analyze and read various articles to find out what we think the truth is. So that's the focus of our curriculum for teaching history. for the whole family how to make this work is we have divided up the year. Let's say, for example, you're studying ancient civilization. So there are 10 to 12 major Socratic discussion questions for the year. And at the end of the year, the students learn how to analyze history. And then they're given open-ended questions that will be their focus for about three weeks three to four weeks. Um, we have sources that we recommend that they use to do their research. And then they present their findings to the family. And the family is allowed to question and to challenge them. Of course, if they're 12 years old and it's the first time they're presenting, we, we have to be loving and gentle parents. But if they're 15 and 16, we can be a little bit, a little bit harder on them. So here are some examples from each of our programs, uh, we have six different curriculum, ancient civilizations, medieval, American, modern American, modern world, and government and economics. So these are, our, I would say, these are the, the thinking books. Uh, these books teach the students how to analyze history and they contain open-ended questions. So some example questions. Uh, I believe I wrote a few on this page that I've given you. Um, yes, there they are. Okay, good. Sample questions for Socratic discussion. What was the greatest reason for the end of the Roman Empire? Why did Rome change from persecuting Christians to adopting Christianity? Was Napoleon a hero or a villain? 
Was Charlemagne more pagan or Christian? Who held more power in medieval Europe, the popes or the kings? What was the primary reason for the Reformation? Was the US justified in dropping the atomic bomb on Japan? Compare and contrast a free market system to a planned economy, which is better? What is the proper role of religion in American education? Who has been America's greatest demagogue? Now these questions are given to the students after they learn the tools of the historian and then they go do their research in a variety of sources. Um, one of the sources we recommend is a, is a standard textbook written by historian or historians who have done the hard work of trying to find out what happened in the past. Other sources that we recommend are primary source documents. So if they're going to read about the Declaration of Independence and what is the most important right in that document, then they need to read the Declaration of Independence. Also, they should read a, a text which describes an author's viewpoint. So they have the actual primary source document and historian working on it, and then they get to discuss that. Now I'd like to show you a few minutes of a Socratic discussion on what was the main reason the Roman Empire fell. And uh, this is something that my, my children and I did together specifically for uh, th this presentation. I, t I have taught all of them um, history, so they were very, very familiar with it. Um, I didn't teach them together because they're of different ages. So we have my oldest daughter, Jessica, who is 18. And I believe Aneshka is here, who's 17. Teresa's um, out of the picture, but she's speaking. She's 15. And Philip, Philip is 13. And um, in our booth today, we have uh, Philip. So I guess you can watch him, how he did. Welcome to the Classical Historian Debate on the fall of the Roman Empire. So the big question here is, what was the main reason for the fall of the Roman Empire? Philip, what do you think? I think the plagues was one of the reasons. Um, over like 20 years, 5 million people died, and then there were enough soldiers to, um, to defend Rome from the Germanic tribes. So Philip, did these plagues have any names, and do you know the years that they happened? One was the Anton Antonine Plague, and it was from 165 to 180. Eighty, and two de two thousand deaths a day, where people died two thousand <laughs> deaths, and and then there was another one called the plague of Cyprian. Okay. Through two hundred fifty A.D. to two hundred seventy, and not many people were able to work because they weren't. All right, and and how again was that the main reason? Um, people couldn't defend the Germanic tribes. Oh, okay, just because there weren't... Enough. Mm -hmm. Anesco, what do you think? Well, I agree with Philip, but also there were economic troubles, and those seem a little more important than the plagues. Um, for example, there were poor harvests, and low income and low tax revenue. And Romans made coins out of cheaper metal, this caused inflation. You know, I remember when I do research on this, it's always hard for me to figure out what years were the poor harvests. But like the textbooks don't really show it. Did, did you find any information about that? When? No. Okay. All right. And what is inflation? What does that mean? I don't understand it. I don't know. Does anyone here know what inflation means? Because um, Sineska said that the coins were made from cheaper metal. Yes, Philip. When the money is, everything becomes so expensive. And so like one dollar would be, um, for a bread, if you had one dollar, it would be like zero, like zero. It wouldn't be anything. Because the price of, the price of the things went up so much. Okay, so rise of prices, all right? Okay, anything else about economic troubles? Um, the government borrowed 
money that they had to pay. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. what do we call that when the government owes money? Um, the government has, has debts. Right, debt. Even though it's spelled with a B, D-E-B-T, we say debt. Very, very good. Okay. Um, Teresa, do you agree with these two, or do you have other reasons? No, I have another reason. I believe the fall of the Roman Empire was caused because um, the two empire, the empire split two. So the regions didn't cooperate when the barbarians attacked, and they didn't have enough armies to fight them off. All right. Uh, so when did they split in two, and was there a particular emperor that did this, and why did he do it? Um, in 395, um, Emperor Theodosius died, and then the other governor, or the governing regions wanted to both be in power, and so they just split. Do we know uh, the capital cities of both of these empires, what they were called? Yeah, Rome was in the west, and Constantinople was in the east. Okay. And that's your main reason. Okay, students. So, you've all raised some good issues. Um, you haven't yet, but I'm just curious. Do you disagree with any one of these students? And do you have any, like, maybe reasons to challenge them? Yes. Because it's, it's good if we can say what we think. But then, now the point is, you have to try to convince the other students what you think is correct. So, what do you think, Jessica? I believe the most important cause for the fall of the Roman Empire was um, the invasion of Germanic and Hun tribes. Um, this was the sole reason for the fall because um, the attacks literally like crumpled the Roman Empire. Um, in 410, um, there was an attack from Alaric I. He captured Rome. In 451, the Huns attacked um, uh, the west of Rome. In 455, Vandals sacked Rome. And in 451, Attila the Huns sacked Rome again. So layers of, uh, of these attacks led to the crumbling of the Roman Empire. And so even though the Roman Empire was split and had economic troubles and had all these other issues, the sole reason was these attacks from outer countries. Hmm. Philip, has she convinced you? No. I think that the, the plagues, or Rome was really strong before and they conquered big areas, but when the plagues hit, there were not enough people and then the barbarian tribes could just take it easily. But if there were hasn't if there weren't the plagues, um, Rome would be strong and be able to defend. Hmm. Well, I I argue inversely. If there weren't any attacks from these Germanic and Hun tribes, then Rome would be still Rome. It wouldn't crumble. What do you two think? Do you, have you been convinced? Um, Jessica's still arguing about the. Germanic invasions and the Hun invasion. Philip's got the plagues. Well, I believe both had an impact on the fall of the Roman Empire, but they weren't the strongest um, causes. Because with if there were um, if Rome was one empire, it would have many more people, and they'd be able to defend it more strongly. But since it's split in two, it's halved, and they can't defend it as well. Hmm. And Anishka, have you been listening and have any of these arguments changed your opinion? You, you had chose the economic troubles as the main reason. What do you think now? Um, I still think that it's economic troubles because um, there are bandits who roam the streets and security couldn't be maintained. And if the bandits were like put into being soldiers or something, they could have helped keep the government up, but instead they had like problems. Well, you know, this own. that's a really good point. This is a really tough uh, question to know definitively. 
I've heard of some argument too I'd like to bring in, and I think this is kind of what I'm thinking about it, that when Rome expanded so, so, to such a great extent, all the way to Britain and the West, to South Africa and the South, up to the Rhine and the North, wherever they went, they collected slaves. And uh, the people of Rome, for example, the city, didn't even have work. They just ate for free and they were supposed to be entertained all the time. And so there was no like dynamic economic. Uh, all right, so that's, that's a sample of a Socratic discussion. And as you see, uh, in our family, each child has very strong opinions and they don't want to admit that the other children will persuade them, or even their dad. They all stuck to their guns. Uh, but what is great about this discussion format is that everything is voiced out loud. All of the major reasons for why the Roman Empire fell, they, they hear it. And if you're teaching one child at a time, what you can do is you can have that child voice all of the different opinions. So first the child will say first what he thinks, and then he'll have to say what, what others think. Did anybody see anything that they found interesting or they'd like to share what they got out of watching that? One thing I would like to share is that um, my children, when you ask them a question about history, they're going to have an opinion about the major topics and they're going to be able to recall a few of the, of the facts to back them up. And this is one thing that I found that is fantastic, is that when they get older, well, 12 and on, and even under that, you don't need to be so worried about testing for what they learned in history. If uh, they can defend themselves in a Socratic discussion and bring up evidence, then they, then they have learned it. Now, because a few years ago, Homeschool Mom asked me to film myself teaching the tools of the historian, we created this curriculum, which has the tools of the historian on a DVD. So you and your children, if you never, most likely you probably didn't learn history this way, you can learn the tools of the historian as I'm teaching a group of junior high kids the tools of the historian. Then we have these books which contain the Socratic discussion questions. And if you notice, when we were having the discussion, each, each kid had a page of notes in front of them. That's because each of the questions, each of the big questions, has a number of pre-writing activities or research activities that they have to answer. So in order to answer what was one of the causes for the fall of the Roman Empire, they need to know some basic facts about the Roman Empire. So these are contained in here as well. And then we have a year guide, if you have children ages 12 or over, for each of these curriculum, which walks you through how, how to teach a lesson that meets once a week for one hour. And it includes um, when to give the assignments, when to teach the tools of the historian, from what sources you can go to, because we don't want the children going on the internet and just researching ran random things. So family time is learning time. I recommend that, if possible, you choose one history content for the year, regardless of the different ages. Uh, the games work excellently for all kids, in including the books. The more you can have your older children take leadership roles at home in teaching, the better. The better it is for the older kids, because they learn what you're going through and they start to mature that way by taking a leadership role. And then keep a schedule. If possible, try to have a time during the week that you're going to have for history games. And, and try to keep that when possible. And uh, if doctor's visits take over that time, then maybe, maybe play after or play before. I'd like to also show you on the, on the back of this page that we were looking at, there is a current event article. About two and a half years ago, I realized that I had nowhere to send my children 
to read about the news. You know, I'm, I'm talking about kids ages 8 to 16. Where do, where, where do they go to find out what's happening in the world on major events where the author has some historical knowledge? I couldn't find any, so I started to write them. Here's an example on tax day. So there's a current event, and I'll write the history of it. And also, I'll usually write what the founding fathers thought about that particular event when, when possible. And I'll also show uh, the different sides of thinking on that particular topic. After the current event, I'll have four simple questions. Who, what, when, where. And then the last question is usually a why, or what do you think? And so that gets the, the kid to, to think about, how does he stand on taxes? What does he, what does he think about them? And so I, I try to write these each week. And on my website, I have about 120 right now um, from 20 different topics. Um, I'm in the middle of writing one on the Ferguson effect and the recent Islamic radical terrorist attack in Orlando. So those will be coming out in the next, in the next few weeks. And um, so you can go on my website under current event blog, and, and there they are for you. Uh, you could also sign up for our email lists. I send out an email uh, every Wednesday with one current event article. Um, sometimes I don't send one out, like this week, because I had the convention. And we don't sell our, e our email list to anyone, or no one else uses them. And then my daughter, who's in Spain, is writing a blog about her travels and also about her college experience at Hillsdale College. And when my son traveled in Asia and Europe, he had his own travel blog as well. So, so these, are, these are nice to see and maybe for you to look forward to when, you, when your kids get older and, and start going on adventures. Thank you very much and have a great conference.